Let us start, start the section with Al Fatiha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 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 So this is the final topic for uh, accounting. Yes. So you have learned how to, uh, you know, the the transaction, the cycle of um accounting process. You also learn how what are the meaning of all the items uh, recorded in the accounting. For example, you have learned what is asset, what is liability, what is equity, what is income, what is uh, expenses, right? And then you also learn about the type of financial statement. For example the statement of comprehensive income, the statement of financial position, the statement of cash flow, the statement of changes in equity, and also the notes to the accounts. And you also have gone through the actual annual, annual report of Nestle Berhad. So that would give you a, a good uh, you know, experience on how, a good knowledge on how financial statements are presented to the users of, of uh, financial uh, uh, records. Yeah, for example, you know, the, the investor, the potential investor and the existing investor, what are the items that they look in when, when they, you know, uh, go through financial statement. Okay, so, so you, re, and then you also, uh, last week, you also learned how to prepare uh, the cash flow statement. Yeah, and then before that, you also learn how to come up with the statement of financial position and statement of uh, comprehensive income. Yeah, so, so, so those are the things that, uh, you know, in the preparation of the accounting, yeah, in the preparation of accounting. And this topic is about how the user can uh, understand financial statement. So this is considered uh, at, at the level where accounting uh, financial uh, accounting records are already presented in all the financial statements and then it is compiled in any report. And then how the user of financial statement will be analyzing the financial statement to understand the performance of companies yeah so the uh, and also other organizations so these are one of the topic one of the ways to interpret the financial statement okay so the, these are the important topic for you as managers because you won't definitely you will be an accountant you won't be an accountant for a company here yeah? because of to be an accountant of course you have to have a, a degree in accounting then you have to do a chartered accountant program uh, and then then only you can become an accountant so for all of you you won't become accountant but you will become manager in islamic financial institution maybe in in, in islamic bank or is or takaful or maybe islamic capital market so as as a manager you need to be able to analyze financial statement and you need to be able to interpret the the financial statement in order to understand the performance of your company or the performance of the company that you your that you want to invest as as manager yeah because of sometimes when you are in bank you need to also analyze the financial statement of the clients yeah if you are in corporate banking for example even as a sharing officer as a sharing officer also you have to be able to understand financial statement and you have to be able to analyze the performance of the companies as well so this is what these are what we will be learning today so a learning objective is at the end of the session you would be able to identify major categories of ratio because what we will be using to analyze financial statement is ratio analysis yeah we will be using ratio analysis there are a few types of analysis that can be done by by the user yeah one of one of them is of course ratio analysis and then sometimes they combine ratio analysis with trend analysis and then sometimes they do the vertical analysis as well. So I will explain to you while we are going through this topic. Okay. So here today, what we will learn is about ratio analysis. Now, what you will learn after the, the complete of this session, you would be able to identify major categories of ratio that can be used for analysis purpose. And then you would be able to calculate important ratios for determining the financial performance and position of a business and then you would be able to interpret the meaning of ratios to the business and you would be able to recognize the limitation of of, of financial ratios as a tool for financial analysis 
All right, so these are the things that you will be achieving at the end of the topic. All right. Okay, so what is financial ratio, right? Financial ratio provide a quick and relatively simple means of examining financial health of a business. Because sometimes you look at the uh, figure itself, it won't give you a full meaning. For example, let's say you see uh, the the turn the revenue of um of Tesla, it is recorded as 50, 15 billion. Yeah. So how can you say whether the company is good or not? And so you have to, uh, so what you do with the ratio is, is if you are, com you will be comparing the figure of revenue with other figure to understand the performance. For example, you will, you will compare, you will take the amount of profit and then you compare with the amount of revenue. Yeah, for example, if the company is uh, earning 50 billion and then the, the uh, profit that they make is 1 billion so which means their profit ratio profit margin ratio is 1 over 50 so they are able to make 1 billion out of 50 billion of sale yeah so you have to compare with another company of in the same uh, business that may be uh, doing uh, 30 billion only sales or revenue but the profit may be 2 billion so which one is good? 2 billion over 30 billion or 1 billion over 50 billion? Yeah, so you have to compare that way. So those ratio is known as profit margin ratio, profit margin. So that, that ratio is showing how much profit that the company is able to make from the amount of sale that they record. So 1 billion over 50 billion is equivalent to what is the ratio? 1 over 50 compared to 2 over 30, definitely 2 over 30 is better, right? So we will learn how to calculate after this, right? And then uh, ratio will be very helpful when comparing the performance of different business entity. Like I said just now, uh, when you want to compare the performance of Nestle with Dash Lady, for example, or Nestle with FNN, for example. So you would be able to compare if you look at the ratio. Because of if you look at the um, uh, the amount of revenue alone, yeah, to compare between um, Nestle and Dash Lady, definitely it is an unfair comparison. For example, uh, Dash Lady uh, is actually uh, for all your information, Dash Lady is a, a smaller in size compared to Nestle. So definitely, the amount of sale of Dash Lady is not as much as Nestle. So if you look at the the amount of revenue alone, it won't be giving you the actual uh, performance of the company with the actual picture of the performance. Okay, so it, it is important to do ratio analysis in order for you to be able to compare the performance among the companies. And then by having a few types of ratio for a business, one would be able to get a good picture of position uh, and performance of the business. So in understanding the performance, you have to do a few ratios to understand because of, uh, uh, after the, the session, you would be able to see that every ratio actually connected to one another. So if the company is good, all the ratio would be good usually. Yeah, of course, there will be one or two that trigger that will trigger our attention. So, which means that the company might have to improve in that particular area. Yeah, but the overall is good. But maybe there are one or two area that that is important for the for the company to focus. All right. So, so those are the things. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, uh, the company might not be good in the performance in the performance, meaning that in the profit, but the company have potential to improve when we look at other areas. For example, uh, maybe that company is not very good in profit yet, yeah, but when we look at the, um, you know, for example, in terms of debt, maybe that company don't have so much debt. So in terms of risk, that company is considered less risky than the company which is highly performed, but have a lot of debt, right? So, so those are the things that we can understand when we do a ratio analysis. And then uh, calculating ratio is easy with formulas given. Of course, when we look at ratio, you will see uh, uh, the formula given for you to calculate the ratio. So it's easy to calculate actually. 
by knowing the formula, you can do. However, to interpret the ratio, in order to interpret the ratio, you have to have knowledge on the industry and its current development. Yeah, it is crucial for you to understand uh, the industry and also the current development in the industry. Okay, ratio help to highlight financial strength and weakness of business, but to understand the reasons underlying them, further analysis need to be done. Okay, so, so as I mentioned here, yeah, to understand uh, what happened to the company, you have to understand uh, further uh, about the industry, for example, or about the company itself, yeah, because a figure itself may be not explaining the overall picture. So you have to understand what actually contributes to the figure. Okay, ratio can be expressed in various form, whether in percentage, in fraction, or in proportion. So it can be in percentage form, in fraction, or in proportion. It can be maybe 30% uh, of profit. The, the, the profit is 30% of sales, for example. Or, you know, uh, the if we are saying about fraction, it can be um, the liquidity ratio is 2 over 1 or the liquidity ratio is 5 over 10. Yeah, so that's fraction. In proportion means that the uh, it can be in this form. Yeah? We can say that, all right, total asset is 2 over 1 asset. The total debt is 2 over 1. So that's its proportion. Yeah? So we will see example after this. Okay, although it is possible to calculate a large number of ratios, only relatively few are meaningful and useful to users. Yes, yeah, so you have to be able to select which one which is relevant to the company or industry that you are choosing, right? Okay, so these are the common types of ratio, profitability ratio, liquidity ratio, efficiency ratio, gearing, and market investment, all right? market or investment ratio. So uh, may, you have to focus on this as well, yes, because uh, I would include this topic in the final assignment. Yeah, I would include this topic in final assignment. So you have to be able to, you know, do the calculation as well. Of course, I will uh, show you the, the lead, the accounts, and then you have to pick the figure and then calculate the ratio, right? So these are the five uh, category of ratios. So profitability ratio, it provides insight to the degree of success in achieving profit. So just like the example that I give you in, uh, in the previous slide, for example, Nestle, uh, 50 billion sale, and then Nestle is making 1 billion of profit. So it will be showing that out of 50 billion of sale, uh, the, the company or Nestle able to achieve 1 billion of profit. So that's what being shown by profitability ratio and yeah, one of the indicators. The second one, liquidity, it is measuring ability of the company to pay short-term oblig obligation. So it is comparing the amount of uh, liquid, uh, liquid asset or current asset with the amount of current liability. So it is like looking at the potential of the company to use its current asset to pay off the current liability. For example, if the company have three creditors of 3,000 and then the, the company have to be to have an amount suffic sufficient to pay off the trade creditors. So amount of uh, current asset because of trade creditors is current liability which Currents mean it is within one year. So you, uh, com the company need to have an uh, asset, which is, you know, the, the, the tenure is one year as well, to be able to use it to pay for the, for the settlement of trade creditors, you know, to pay for the creditors, for the trade, but, uh, for the trade amount, yeah? Okay, so efficiency ratio, as the name implies, it assess the efficiency of business to generate revenue and profit using its asset. So most of the ratios in efficiency ratio is about asset. For example, asset turnover, inventory turnover. And so this is actually to measure the efficiency of the company to generate sale from the asset. 
to generate profit from the assets that they have, right? So it, the name is efficiency ratio. The next one is gearing ratio. So gearing ratio is actually uh, to measure how the uh, the risk of uh, the risk faced by the company. It is by looking at the the debt, the amount of debt that the company have. So it is like you know try to 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 see whether the company is able to to balance between. Uh, you know, depending on third parties' money or their own money, you know, between uh, equity and liability. So whether the company is depending more on debt or the company actually have their own sources of income to, to generate their business. Yeah, so those are the things that is measured by gearing ratio. The final one is market or investment ratio. It is actually to measure the asset value of the business to its shareholder. So it, this is actually looking from the point of view of investor to see whether the investor actually uh, have value in the business. For example, in terms of how much the profit made for every single share or how much dividend is paid for the shareholders. So those are the things measured by market and investment ratio. Okay, let us look at profitability ratio. So a profitability ratio allow user to evaluate the company's return on investment. So uh, this is actually to measure profitability to show whether the investment made in the company is actually a wise decision or not. Because of, of course, as investor, when they invest in the company, they want to see that the company is making profit from their money. From using their money, the company can make profit. So those are the things that is measured by profitability ratio. They focus on the company's resources and levels of profit and involve identifying and measuring the impact of various profitability drivers. So profitability drivers include the revenue itself. Yeah, the revenue itself is the profitability driver. Definitely, for a company to make profit, they have to make sales first. They have to create, generate sales first. So, uh, the sale or revenue is the main uh, driver for profitability. And then second driver is cost of goods sold. Yeah, the cost of goods sold. So definitely, in order to make good profit, the cost of goods sold have to be minimum, have to be minimized. Have to, so the company have to make sure uh, when they make the sale, the cost of sale have to be minimum so that they can make a good profit. Yeah, if let's say the sale, uh, the sale revenue is let's say 10,000 and then the cost itself is 9,000. So definitely the profit is just 1,000. So, which is not very good. So, usually company want to see if the sale is uh, 10,000, for example, the, pro the profit must be at, you know, at least 3,000. So, meaning that the cost of profit, uh, cost of goods sold will be only like 7,000. So, the best possible, the company should reduce the cost to, to be able to make a better profit. Okay, and then they also include evaluation of two major sources of profitability, which is the income and expenditure. Yes, yeah, so of course, the one that I mentioned to you, uh, the, the sales, sale is income. And then the cost of goods sold is actually expenditure. And then, of course, there are other types of expenditure that you already learned a uh, few weeks ago. Yeah? For example, when we talk about administrative sales and administrative expenditure, and then uh, sales and promotion, for example. And then we have another category, which is general expenditure. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, and then we also have finance costs. So all those costs is actually determining the profit that the company uh, earn yeah, after, after the end of the tenure. So that's why it is important to, to be able to measure the profitability ratios. Okay, profitability analysis also focuses on reasons for change in profitability and the sustainability of earnings, right? So it will, it will also show you the reasons, yeah? the focus on the reasons uh, for changes in profitability and sustainability of earnings so to see whether 
uh, what will be determining the, the the profitability level and what will be you know ensuring the sustainability of the earnings to ensure that the company will always able to make profit. So there are a few types of profitability ratio. The first one is gross profit margin. Second one is net profit margin. Third one, return on asset, return on shareholders fund, and return on capital employed. Yeah. Five, gross profit margin, net profit margin, return on asset, return on shareholders fund, and also return on capital employed. So let us go through one by one. Gross profit margin. It is actually re relating the gross profit to the sales generated for the same period. So it is relating the gross profit with sales. So it compare the gross profit with the sales generated for that particular period. And then it represents difference between sales and the cost of sales or the cost of goods sold. So it is like identifying how much the profit is. And then it measures the profitability in buying or producing and selling goods before other expenses are taken into account. So it is like, you know, before we calculate, before we deduct the uh, sales and promotion, before we deduct the administrative expenditure. So the first level is gross profit margin, whereby uh, we take the amount of revenue, we minus the amount of good, uh, cost of goods sold. Then we get gross profit margin. Okay, we are not actually deducting yet the sales and promotion and then the administrative expenditure. Okay. A change in this ratio has can have significant effect on the net profit of for the year. So if you look at the gross profit margin, it should be positive. Then only the next next level would be positive as well. Yeah, gross profit is the first. Uh, level of profit. Uh, so uh, gross profit is achieved when the company uh, may, uh, deduct the amount of goods sold. Yeah? If you can reflect what we learn when we look at the uh, financial report or financial statement of Nestle, you will remember that okay, the first is about, uh, this is about the statement of an, uh, comprehensive income, right? So the first is revenue, right? And then after that, cost of goods sold, COGS. Then after you minus, you get the gross profit. Gross profit. And then after you got the gross profit, then only you minus, uh, you add or minus other income or other expenditure. Yeah, so add or minus other income or expenditure. And then you minus uh, sales and sales and uh, promotion expenditure. And then you minus administrative expenditure, for example, the salary of the secretary or the HR department, so yeah, the administrative expenditure. And then for that you minus and you add with uh, the finance, uh, finance cost and finance income. Yeah, and then after that, you what we will get is profit before tax. Yeah, what you got, yeah, after you deduct all the expenditure is profit before tax, PBT. Yeah, and then from PBT, what you have to deduct is tax. Yeah, when you deduct PBT with uh, with tax, then only you will get PAT. Yeah, PAT is profit after tax all right okay so usually after pat after profit after tax then the company will add other other expenditure or other income coming from other sources for example a hedging activities and all that uh, so that and then finally what they will get is profit for the year Okay, so that's what you will uh, you will go through. So actually, gross profit margin is the first level. Okay, so once if the profit um, uh, gross profit margin is not good, let's say negative, so definitely the the you know the PBT also so negative, and then the profit after tax will also be negative. Okay, it will be connected to one another. 
Okay, uh, so this is the formula. Let me uh, erase yeah, all those, uh, the, you know, the one that I wrote here. So this is the formula. Gross profit divide by sales and then multiply with 100 and then uh, you will get percentage. For example, in the case of 1 billion, yeah, 1 billion divided by 50 billion, it would be yeah, 1 billion sale uh, profit, let's say, divided by 50 billion sale. 1 billion, 50 billion. So what would be the result? Yeah, what would be the result? Anybody? Do you have calculator with you? One over 15. One over 50. The percentage is 2%. Yeah, it's equal to 2%. Yeah, so in percentage form. All right. Okay, let us continue. Any question on this? What it indicates from, from 58 billion sale and then uh, the profit is 1 billion. Okay, this is an example of Nestle actually. From the year 2015 to the year 2017. 2015, this is the amount of profit. This is the amount of sale. So the profit margin is, gross profit margin is 38.6. Yeah. In the year 2015, and then it increased to 39.4 in the year 2016, and then in the year 2017, the profit the profit further decreased yeah, uh, to 36.7. So what you can see here, yeah, the profit margin has been on the you know declining uh, pattern in the year 2017. It declines from 36.7 and uh, it declines from 39.4 to 36.7, right? So that's how the, you know, percentage explain you to help to, to uh, help you to explain you know, the performance of the company. Okay, so, so this is actually showing uh, like a uh, quite cyclical, yeah, but it's not that actually, it's not that uh, drastic changes in terms of the percentage. For example, this one is 36.8, this one is 39.4, and then this one is 36.7. It is like a bit of volatile, but not that volatile. Yeah, it's like a bit stable. So what we can see here is sales increase throughout the three years period under review. So if you look at the figure of sales, yeah, the, the one below here from 4.8 to 5.0 to 5.2. So it has been increasing. However, Gross profit margin, which is the, the numerator for gross profit margin from 1.8, it grew up to 1.99, and then later it goes down to 1.93. Yes, so it is mentioned here gross profit margin increased into 176, however, declined into 17. This is due to the increase in cost of goods sold in 217 that resulted in decrease in the profit margin of 217. Okay, so in, in 216 and 217, what happened is the cost of goods sold is higher compared to the rest of the year. Okay, so that's why the profit margin shrink from the year 216, yeah, and also from the year 215. Okay, uh, so this is about net profit margin. So first, uh, gross profit margin. So this is the next level, which is net profit margin. So this relates the net profit from the for the period of this uh, to the sales during the period. So it is looking at the net profit and also the sale pro, uh, sale um, sale amount. Yeah, the net profit and sale amount. So you usually they use the level of profit before interest and tax because it represents the profit from trading operation before the before the interest costs are taken into account and uh, tax being charged of the business. So usually uh, for net profit margin, the company usually the usually use the level of prof, uh, profit before interest and tax, whereby they take the profit amount. And then they add back with the interest 
and then we did add back with the tax to see whether the company ha has actually performed operationally or not. Okay, so because of sometimes people uh, lost because of they have to pay tax while actually the performance is good. Yeah, or sometimes it is because of interest expenditure, where interest expenditure are actually coming from, uh, you know, from the loan that, that they borrow from the bank or from the financing that they borrow, uh, that they get from the Islamic bank. So uh, that, that, in, that loan definitely carry interest or carry profit uh, charge yeah, to, the, to the borrower. So, so this, this uh, ratio will help us to see whether uh, the performance is actually, uh, is actually affected or not by the interest interest portion and also tax portion. Yeah, so because what we want to see is the profit at the operational level. So this is considered the most appropriate way to measure net profit as it does not take into account how business is being financed. So it is just looking at the, uh, it is more appropriate because it is just looking at the operational level of the company. It is ignoring the impact of uh, finance cost to the company. So this ratio varies consider, see considerably between types of business. Yeah, because uh, if you look at the uh, consumer goods company, yeah, the consumer goods industry, for example, uh, Nestle and Dash Ready, the profit margin won't be that high because of the the you know the cost is also high. And then uh, usually the profit margin is not very high, yeah, because of and then further because of the companies is usually pay uh, all about cash transaction usually, yeah. Um, uh, so if you compare with the uh, construction company, for example, the construction company they usually can mark up the price of their the project. You know, uh, sometimes they have a margin is very high, uh, more higher. In, in construction, for example, compared to consumer goods. So this is the formula, profit before interest and tax, divide by sales and then multiply with 100. Multiply with 100 is just to get the percentage. Okay, so this is an example of net profit margin for Nestle again for the year 2015 to the year 2017. So if you look at the ratio itself from 14.3 from increased to 14.4 and further increased to 14.7. So what does it show here is, uh, you know, like a steady uh, trend of increase, steady trend of increase. So it keep on increasing from the year 2015 to 2017. How could this happen? It is actually indicating that the company is efficient in managing other expenditure and yeah, because of when we look at the uh, cash uh, net, uh, pro gross profit margin before so gross profit margin the one that we uh, analyze the sales and the gross profit margin or in other words it is about cost of goods sold so when we look at this ratio the ratio increase into 176 but decrease into 17 so this is actually the result of the cost of goods sold which is much higher in the year 2017. Yeah, so however, even though the company uh, may, uh, you know, make a, a, a slightly uh, decline in the gross profit margin, however, in, in terms of the net profit margin, their, their rate is increasing in the year 2017. So which means that the company is actually efficient in managing its other expenditure, for example, the sales expenditure or the finance costs and also the administrative costs. So they are efficient in managing all those three, uh, uh, three expenditure. Okay, this reveals the efficiency of the company in managing its other expenses that resulted in higher net profit before interest and tax, even though its gross profit declined. Yeah, I showed to I showed to you that the gross profit margin declined in the year two one seven. However, in the year two o one, for for profit margin net profit margin for the year two one seven is still increased. So it shows that uh, the, the company is efficient in managing the other types of expenditure.
Okay, this is another ratio for profitability, which is return on assets. So the formula is profit before interest and tax divided by average total assets. So this is actually looking at the ability of the company to make profit out of total assets. So ROA is a fundamental measure of business performance. Yeah, hold on. Eh? Okay, uh, all right. So return on the side. It, uh, I already explained that it is actually looking at the ability of the company to generate profit from its assets. Yeah? So it is a fundamental measure of business performance. It is expressing the relationship between net profit margin with net profit with the, uh, with the asset, ability of the company to generate profit from asset. So usually company will, will you know, invest in asset. They will buy building, they will buy machinery. So when we look at this ratio, it is actually indicating whether the, the company's decision to invest in asset is actually a wise decision or not. Yes, so because of every decision to buy assets, to add asset, should generate more business, to generate more sales and more profit. Yes, yeah, so if this ratio is showing a decline, so uh, this is actually indicating that the decision to add the asset is not actually a wise decision. Okay, uh, profit figure used in this ratio is the net profit before interest and tax. So this will help user to measure both the efficiency and effectiveness with which assets are used. So uh, interest is the financing expenditure, not operating expenditure. Yeah? So as I explained earlier, why we take the profit before interest and tax is because of we want to see the, the, the performance of the company at the operational level, not considering the interest uh, in, uh, uh, incurred by interest expenditure incurred by the company. Okay, uh, while the other item, which is tax, is subject to fluctuation over time as the rules change, policy of the government also change. So it, this is not so much uh, due to the operation, operation of the company, but it is more about the sometimes because of the policy of the, of the government. Yeah. Okay, this is the example of Nestle. So the return on the set of Nestle from 28.1 to 29.7 and then increase further to 30.67 correct so what we can say here is Nestle have a uh, return on total asset which is increasing throughout the three years period so which is indicating a good performance of Nestle okay this is the return on shareholders fund so this is actually showing the profit to every one ringgit of share contributed by the owner. Yeah, it compares the amount of profit for the period to the owner's stake in the business. So uh, to the owner's equity in the business. Owner's stake is, means that owner's equity. Okay, so usually the profit that we take uh, to measure this is profit after tax and preference dividend. So this is used to represent the amount of profit available to the ordinary shareholders who are the owner of business. So we, if the uh, so if only the company have preference share, so we will look at the profit after tax and minus the uh, preference dividend. So uh, when we deduct the dividend for the preference shareholder, what left in in the account is profit after tax, which is actually available for the ordinary shareholders. So that's why we have to deduct the preference preference dividend first if the company have preference shareholders okay so um, most of the company don't have preference shareholder yeah usually they only have ordinary shareholders so you can always take the amount of profit after tax and divide by divide by the shareholders fund 
Okay, business usually would seek as high as possible value for the ratio, provided that it is not achieved. Uh, it is not achieved at the expense of potential return by taking uh, on more risky activities. Okay, so this is the formula: profit after tax divided by shareholders fund. So this is example for Nestle. So if you look at the profit after tax uh, and preference dividend. For Nestle, it is increasing from 587 to 631 and then further increase to 638. And then divide by uh, the shoulders fund. If you look at the shoulders fund, uh, it is actually decrease, decreasing. Yeah, decreasing. So why shoulders fund decreasing? Because usually shoulders fund consists of the capital itself and then it is also Inclu uh, inclusive of the you know profit or even the payment of dividend. So it, for Nestle, they had they use the profit to pay dividend a lot. So this actually that this uh, decline is due to the you know payout of dividend. They pay out dividend uh, quite significant. So that's why the amount here is reducing. So that result in the ratio increase. Yeah, so this is showing a good indicator for investors. So when investors see this, definitely they want to invest in the share because they know that for every one ringgit share that they have in the company, the company is making profit of 82.89 into 15. And then the profit increased further to 97 and further increased to 99%. So meaning that for every ringgit that shareholders have in the business, the company make 99 cents of profit. Okay, this one, return on capital employed. It is about return, still looking at the profit. So it is expressing the relationship between the net profit generated by the business and the long-term capital invested in the business. So what is long-term capital? Yeah, we will look into it. So this uh, profit before interest and tax is used because the ratio attempt to measure the returns to all supplier of long-term finance before any deduction is made for interest and lenders. So again, it is looking at the level of profit before interest and tax because we want to see the operational profit that is generated by the company from the long-term capital. Yes, so long-term capital is about the loan and also the equity and the long-term loan, yeah? Right, so ROCE is considered to be primary measure of profitability. It compares the input, which is the capital invested, and yeah, the capital employed or capital invested with the profit itself. So this is vital to assess the effectiveness in deploying the funds. So the ratio is profit before interest and tax divided by shareholders fund, yeah, or the FVT plus the long term loans. So this is the capital employed. Yes. Yeah, so usually the um, the the you know the ratio is lower than the ROE, the one that we looked uh, before this. Yeah, because this include as well the long term loans. So for this particular company, yeah, the the ROCE is eighty five in the year two one five. Increased to 1998 in the year 2016 and further increased to 106, 106.44. All right, so it, it is increasing. So we show that it is very good. Yeah, so for this ratio, not only the equity holders, which is the shareholders, which will be happy to see the increase, but even to the uh, bank as well, the bankers, when they provide loan to the company, and then they see that this company have a good ROCE, so they will they will not be hesitate to uh, provide more financing to the companies, yeah, because the company able to make profit of every single ringgit of uh, loans that they have. Okay, now now is the second category of ratio, which is known as liquidity ratio. Right, so liquidity ratio refers to the company's ability to meet its short-term obligation, yeah, short-term liability, short-term debt, right? So it is measuring the ability of the company to pay off its debt, short-term debt. 
Alright, liquidity is the ability to convert assets into cash. Yes, yeah? so it is like you know how uh, how fast the money can sell off its inventory, how fast the money the company can collect the debt from the trade uh, debtors in order to pay off its current liability. Alright, short term refers to the period of less than one year, one year and less. Yeah. And then the importance of liquidity is best understood by considering the repercussions stemming from the company's inability to meet short-term obligation. We just imagine if the company do not have enough current assets, yeah, do not have enough uh, money in the bank, for example, definitely they will have difficulties to take opportunity if, if the you know favorable discounts are available for example the supplier want to offer better discount for their goods so definitely without cash they won't be able to buy right uh, it is also implied uh, the limited like, opportunities and constraint on management action so sometimes you know, uh, the company want to take opportunity of, uh, you know, maybe something like uh, the investment is very, very cheap. So they won't be able to, 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 uh, to take the, that to invest because they don't have money, right? Extreme liquidity problem affect the company's ability to pay its current obligation, which will lead uh, the forced sales of investment and assets and in more severe form, the insolvency and uh, bankruptcy. So this is very important. Yeah? If the company don't have money to pay, to pay it, it creditors. So definitely, uh, if the situation is severe, then the creditors can take action to the com uh, on the company. The company, uh, the uh, the comp uh, the the you know the debt creditors can uh, maybe sue. The company in court so that they can get back their their debts. Okay, so this is the type of liquidity ratio. One is current ratio, another one is asset test ratio. Current ratio it compares the liquid asset, which is cash, and those asset that soon to be turned into cash, and then um, uh, it compares with the short term liabilities, right? So it is like measuring uh, for every uh, single ringgit of short-term liability, how much asset that the company have to pay off the liability. Okay. All right. So this is another ratio, which is known as a sit test ratio. A sit test ratio represents a more stringent test of liquidity. Inventory cannot be converted into cash quickly. So uh, for this particular sit test ratio, uh, inventory will be taken out. Yeah, because uh, inventory is not that easy to be converted into cash. That, that's why they are excluded from the liquid asset. So let us look at the current ratio. Ideal current ratio is normally two. Yeah, normally two. So to indicate that for every one ringgit liability, there is two ringgit of asset to cover it. Yeah, uh, so for example, if you have a debt of one ringgit, so if you have an asset of two ringgit, then you are considered uh, as liquid because of you have money to pay off your debt. Yeah, but if you don't have money to pay debt, that is considered that you are illiquid. Yeah, something that not liquid. In reality, different type of business require different current ratio. Yeah, so some company they are seems like illiquid, but some company can be very liquid. So the different type of industry will, will have different ratio. Yeah, for example, manufacturing versus hypermarket. Yeah, hypermarket usually very liquid because of uh, usually their assets made up of current asset and current liability. Manufacturing, sometimes uh, they have a lot of uh, assets. So that's why they are not that liquid, right? Usually they have fixed asset. Uh, machinery plant, so that's why they are not that liquid. Okay, for current, for current ratio, the higher the ratio, the more liquid the business. As liquidity is vital for business survival, a higher current ratio might be considered as more favorable for the business. Definitely, if 
uh, that if one person have uh, you know two ringgit of asset for every one ringgit of debt compared to another person who have five ringgit of asset compared to two ringgit of debt so definitely the second one is better because uh, his current ratio is higher which is five over two compared to um, one over three for example Okay, however, if the ratio is very high, then that reveal that the fund are tied up in cash or other liquid asset that are not used effectively. So if the current ratio is very high, yeah, let's say the company have 100 times of current ratio, which means that the company have a lot of cash in the in bank, a lot of cash in inventory, so which is not a good indicator because of that money should be utilized for the business. That company should be utilized and generate more money for the business. The company shouldn't be like keeping the money at home or keeping the company under the uh, keeping the money under the pillow. That wouldn't be be making money for the business, right? So this is the formula. So for uh, Nestle, so in the year two o one seven the ratio is higher than 216, right? So we can say that it is up and down. Yeah, in the year 2016, it is, all right, it is down. In the year 2017, it is up again. It down and up. Okay, this is what a seat test ratio. A seat test ratio is actually uh, a more stringent ratio. It is looking at the Minimum level uh, at the uh, liquidity again, but it is like a more rigid liquidity. Yeah. Okay. This is actually measuring. Okay. Uh, minimum. Uh, minimum level for this ratio is one. To reflect that, for one ringgit uh, current liability, there are one ringgit of highly liquid asset to cover them. So the at least the company have to have one ratio of one times which is to show that for every one ringgit um, liability that, that the company have, the company also have one ringgit of uh, uh, one ringgit of liability. So this is to show that they, they, they don't have to worry because they are able to pay. Yeah? However, it is just enough. One, one time it is just enough. It is normal for some company to have a ratio of below one times uh, without causing particularly particular problem. So there are companies like, like, like heavy negative, but they are good actually. So they are a lot. So this is the formula. Current asset minus inventory and then uh, divide by current liabilities. So for small Nestle, it is actually uh, decreased in the year 2016 and then increased in the year 2017. Okay, so now this is another category of ratio which is known as efficiency ratio. Okay, efficiency ratio. Okay, uh, can I have uh, two minutes? Yeah, two minutes. Okay, maybe we take five minutes break. Yeah, five minutes break. Okay, hold on. Five minutes break from now.
Hello, Assalamualaikum. Can you continue? Waalaikumsalam. Yeah. Let me continue, yeah? Waalaikumsalam. Okay, uh, all right. So this is uh, another category of ratio, which is known as efficiency ratio. So efficiency ratio is actually, as the name implies, measure the efficiency of the company. So efficiency of the company in managing its asset, we should give another name for this ratio, which is asset management ratio. So this ratio is also known as asset management ratio. This ratio are important as they reflect the effectiveness in the investment decision made by the company. So usually the company, of course, in running the business, they need to decide on whether they need to add further the asset. For example, to, to buy another building, to buy machinery, and maybe to venture into new line of business, or maybe they have to maybe acquire another business. All those decisions, of course, need to be evaluated earlier. Yeah? But however, every decision, every decision to, to add assets, yeah, to invest in assets, will supposedly be compensated with the additional amount of sales. So then only it is a wise decision. Yes, so the company's decision to invest in new building, for instance, should be compensated with appropriate increase in revenue and also profit. So this is measured by sales to fixed asset ratio, which compare the amount of sales to total fixed asset. So this, uh, the type of financial efficiency ratio, there are five. There are five efficiency ratio, which is the first one, sales to fixed asset ratio, which measure the amount of sales able to be uh, generated from the fixed asset. So this one is about capital sales to capital employed. This one's average stock turnover ratio. This one is average settlement period for debtors, and this one average settlement period for creditors. Okay, so the first one, sales to fixed asset ratio. So uh, this, the fixed asset turnover, this is also known as fixed asset turnover ratio. Yeah, this is also known as fixed asset turnover ratio because this is measuring uh, how, how many times uh, the fixed asset can be utilized to generate sales. Okay, so usually it is used in manufacturing industry, industry, but that makes substantial purchase in order to drive up the output. Usually manufacturing companies, they will have to buy inventories, they have to buy new machineries, and then sometimes they have to buy a motor vehicle to, to, you know, to, to help them in the operation. So when the company makes such a significant purchases of assets, investor usually will closely monitor whether uh, monitor this ratio in subsequent years to observe whether the decision is effective or not, whether the, uh, the decision to invest in fixed asset is effective or not. You know, for example, if the company buy new machinery, investor will want to see that the new machinery is able to generate more income to the company. Now, overall, investment in fixed assets are represented, representative of the sole largest component of the company's total asset. Now, fixed asset especially, it is actually making uh, the most significant portion of the total assets. So this ratio calculated annually is constructed in a way that is purposeful in reflecting how efficiently the company, primarily the company's management management team, um, uh, you know the, the efficiency of the, the the use of their assets to generate revenue for the firm. Okay. The formula is sales or revenue divided by total asset. Yeah. So this is to show how much the the assets can generate sales. Example yeah, for for the for Nestle, the amount of sales is five million in the year two o one one seven, compared to fixed asset of one point four four million. So this show that the the sales to uh, that 
from every one ringgit sale and uh, from every one ringgit of a set yeah here, here this what what does it reflect by 3.65 times is for every one ringgit of a uh, total asset every one ringgit of total fixed asset the company managed to generate 3.6 times 65 times of revenue yeah so they are able to generate 3.6 five ringgit of revenue or sales okay so that's what indicated by this ratio all right now the one is sales to capital employed yeah so this is comparing the amount of sales to uh, capital employed it is showing how efficiently the sales are generated from capital employed by the firm this ratio helps investor or creditor to determine the ability of a firm to generate revenue from the capital employed and act as a key decision factor for lending more money to the asking firm. So meaning that a bank, for example, they will look at this ratio to see whether every ringgit that they give, uh, that they lend to the company is able to help generate more sales or not. So if the company is efficient in using its loan to generate more sales, so definitely the bank will not hesitate to give more loans to the company. So generally, a higher ratio is preferred by the shareholders and lenders. However, a very high ratio may suggest that the business is overtrading its asset, which also means that the company do not have enough asset or insufficient asset to sustain the level of sales achieved. So the company, if, if the ratio is too high, it shows that uh, the company need to add more assets to, to, you know, to generate more sales. If not, the company won't be able to maybe generate higher sales if they don't uh, tackle the problem. So this is the formula, sales divided by shareholders fund plus long-term loans. So for Nestle, so this, uh, this uh, ratio again show an increase from 6.01 to 6.84, further increase to 7.26. So what does it mean by this ratio into 17? Uh, from every one ringgit of, yeah, 7.26 means for every one ringgit of shareholders fund and uh, long-term loans, the company is able to make a, a, a sale of 7.26 ringgit yeah for every one ringgit of loans on equity the company able to make 7.26 ringgit of sales okay and the next one average stock turnover ratio so stocks and when we talk about stocks it is about inventory so inventory or stocks it represents significant investment for the business why it is significant because so for the company to be able to sell their goods and yeah, they have to buy inventory first they have to have inventory whether they buy uh, the finished good from the vendor or they buy raw material and then they process it turn it into finished good then that will be the inventory of that company before they are able to sell. Okay, so uh, the formula is using average stock. Yeah, If you look at here, the formula is using average stock. What does it mean as average? Average stock can be calculated by the simple average by, the, by taking the opening and closing stock levels for the year. So uh, to get an average, we have to get a, a figure which is from the beginning period to end period, and then we divide by two. We add the beginning period and end period, the amount, then we divide by two. So that's the average. However, in case of highly seasonal business, where stock levels may vary considerably over the year, a monthly average may be more appropriate. So for some company, they are, they are, you know, their, their business are seasonal. For example, uh, hotels, for example, usually during, in, 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 in during uh, school holidays, the, um, uh, the number of equipments will be higher. So definitely that will contribute to the income, uh, to the revenue of the hotels. Yeah? So if we look at the 
you know, the beginning at the end figure definitely it doesn't reflect the actual picture. We have to look at the monthly figure. Okay, this ratio vary according to the type of business. Again, every different type of business have its own ratio. We cannot uh, compare uh, the performance of uh, manufacturing company with airline company. We cannot. We have to compare Apple with Apple. Airline company have to be compared with airlines. We cannot compare two different industry companies from two different industry. Okay, so uh, usually for the type of business, example manufacturing, stocks are, um, account for substantial proportion of total assets. So this might result in higher ratio, which seems like unfavorable. So if you look at the this ratio for manufacturing company, it will seems like uh, they are having very high ratio, which uh, like indicates that this is not that good. Yeah, however, it is because of they are manufacturing, and usually they will need more. They will need more uh, assets. Yeah, they will need no more inventory. So, uh, so this is the formula for this is the example for Nestle. So if you look at the average stock turnover ratio, the ratio is around 50 to 52, 52, 50, 52 and 51. So it's not that actually ridiculous change of uh, ratio, which means that the company is stable in its operation. Its ability to generate, uh, to turn over its stock and yeah, to generate sale from its stock is about the same throughout the three years. Okay, so this one is about average settlement period for debtors. So this is actually measuring ability of the company to pay off its debt to the, uh, to get back the debts from the debtor. So to collect the debts from the debtor. So usually uh, business will be very concerned with how long it takes for the customer to pay uh, the amount which is owed by the customer to the company. Definitely the, the company will be very uh, worried about, you know, late payment, for example. Yeah. Okay, the speed of payment can have significant effect on cash flow of the business. This ratio calculate how long the average customer take to pay the debt. Yeah, so it is actually indicating how long the customer pay uh, customer take to pay off the debts. Of course, the shorter the better. Okay, the shorter the better for the company. So this is the formula, trade data divided by credit sales. Okay, so example of Nestle, debtors divide by credit sales. So um, Nestle also indicate like a stable trend, 44, 39 and 40. Okay, so at 44 declined to 39, then after that it increased to 40, 40 times. So it shows that uh, ability of the company to collect its debts is about uh, 40 days in a year. Okay, this one uh, about settlement period for creditor. Just now it's about uh, settlement period of debtors. So this one is settlement period for creditors. All right, so this ratio measure how long on average the business take to pay off their creditor. Yeah, so this is uh, usually not information is not adequate for you to do this particular ratio. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as trade creditors provide free source of finance for the business, it is perhaps not surprising that some business will delay in payment. So what does it mean? Yeah? For example, uh, if you are selling the uh, textbook, for example, yeah, and then you are getting consignment from the from the bookstore. You are getting consignment from bookstore, and then uh, you take time to pay the creditor. Yeah. So if the creditor not happy with you, they can stop supplying to you, right? So that's why you have the company have to take care of their payment to the creditor. Okay, uh, late payment to creditor can result in loss in goodwill among supplier, right? So the supplier won't trust the company anymore. 
So this is the formula, trade creditor divide by credit purchase. So for Nestle, all right, why I don't have example? Because uh, usually it's very difficult. It is not available in the annual report actually. Yeah, we have to ask the management to get the amount, all right? So that's why it is not, I don't have the, the example. Usually the amount of trade credit, uh, this, this particular data, trade creditors, how much trade creditors that the company have, and then how much credit purchase usually being being kept being kept confidential by the company. Okay, the next uh, ratio, the next category of ratio is gearing ratio. Gearing ratio it measure the the amount of debt that the company have. Yeah, uh, the amount of ratio that uh, the amount of debt that the company have. So, it, uh, gearing occur, yeah? gearing occur when the business is financed at least in part by borrowing instead of by owner. So, meaning that apart from relying to the owner of the business, which is the shareholder, so the company also uh, most of the time they will get borrowing from the bank. So this ratio is measuring what is their exposure to the loan from the bank. Okay, gearing ratio measure, measure the extent to which a business is financed by sources that requires a fixed return. Yeah, fixed return means the, the loan. It is an important factor in assessing risk exposed by the company from its borrowing. And then when the business is financed heavily, it takes commitment to pay interest charges and capital repayment. So if the company relies so much on loan, definitely the company have to be committed to pay interest charges and capital repayment. Okay, uh, okay. This, this is the first one, long-term liability and equity. So it is measuring uh, how much the uh, long-term liabilities compared to equity. Higher ratio indicate a company has a higher degree of financial leverage and is more susceptible to downturns in economy and business cycle. Susceptible means it is fragile. Yeah, if if the if there is economic downturn or financial difficulties, definitely the company will have problem. Yeah, because of they have a harsh, much reliance on the debt from the from a third party this is because company that have higher leverage have higher amount of debt when compared to owners equity therefore companies with high ratio have uh, higher amounts of debt to serve to service so companies with lower ratio calculation may ha have more equity to rely upon as financing is needed so they don't have so for companies with low uh, miracle usually they pay uh, and they are comfort uh, they are you know like favorable in their ratio that sh that means also they have less debt so the formula is long term liability divided by shareholders fund multiply with 100 so the uh, so this is what uh, the example of nestle from 25.1 to 27.7 to 27.2. So if you look at the shareholders figure from 708 to 604 to 739. So it is like declining in the year 2017. So the same goes to uh, long-term liability as well. From 177 increase to 179 and decrease to 174. So that's why the shareholders fund also decrease the, the long-term liability to equity ratio also decrease to 27.2%. Okay, so this is about comparing the total liability and total shareholders fund or total equity. This is measuring the contribution of total liability to the equity of the company. Higher ratio indicate that the company has a higher dependence on third-party financing. In economic and business downturn, the company would be facing the risk of inability to pay of the higher liability. This is similar to what I explained earlier. Yeah? 
Failure to pay liability, for example, will lead to the business in disruption. For example, if let's say they uh, they don't pay your uh, the the bill, yeah, so definitely it will give impact to the business continuity. Okay, the formula is total liabilities divided by shareholders fund. In this case, yeah, um, the case of um, <laughs> the case of Nestle, their liabilities is much higher than than equity. So what does it show here is they rely much on the liability compared to their shareholders fund. All right, so this is about debt to equity. So again, it is looking at the uh, debt compared to equity. So this is actually to measure dependence of the company on interest-bearing loan. It reveals the riskiness of the company in its financing activities. Yes, yeah, so of course, when the company have high loan, so definitely they are also susceptible to financial problem. They will have to bear a lot of costs related to their, their loans. Interest-bearing debt has a double swap impact to the company. Yeah, pay, failure to pay the debt will result in the compounding interest, which will further add to the burden of the company in business downturn. Yeah, of course, having a, a lot of debt will detrimental will be detrimental to the company. One in the sense that, of course, uh, if something happened to them, they don't. Uh, let's say the company, uh, the creditors charge them, or the bank charge them because of they are not able to pay. So, uh, so this will, of course, uh, lead the business into trouble. Interest bearing debt are usually associated to financial institution, which has strong pushing power that uh, can more, can that can cause the company to be liquidated in the case of default. So, if the company fails to pay, creditor can take action to bank to to declare the company as bankrupt. So, this is the formula. Long term plus short term borrowing. This is focusing on borrowing alone and share this fund. Okay, so this is the debt to equity ratio. Uh, debt to equity ratio uh, for of Nestle. So if you look at here, uh, it is increasing quite drastically in the year 2017. So this, uh, so if you look at the, uh, the figure, here, in terms of shareholders fund, it is decreasing on decreasing trend. As I mentioned, that they pay dividend a lot, and then in terms of borrowing, they increase a lot in the year two one seven. So that's explain the the sharp increase in the ratio. Okay, this is the last one: interest cover ratio. This is actually showing the ability of the company to pay off the interest. So the amount that they take here is profit before interest and tax. And then after that, they divide by interest expense. So this is to see how much coverage that they have in terms of interest. So for, uh, for Nestle, the, the ratio is 20, 21, and 21. So not much different from one year to another, right? Okay, so okay, now this is the final ratio. Okay, give me one minute. Okay, so this is the last ratio, last category of ratio, which is known as market ratio. So market ratio is uh, allow user, especially the investor or potential investor, to evaluate whether uh, the value of their investment to see whether uh, for the for the existing shareholder, 
or the existing investor, it will allow them to evaluate their current investment. For the potential investor, this ratio allow them to evaluate whether they should invest or not in the company. All right? This is what mentioned here. Yeah. For existing shareholder, they would want to know whether the company has potential to keep on paying their dividend or not. And then they would also know whether the company has potential to increase its value that might be given them opportunity to reap capital gain in the future. For potential investor, usually they will see the market ratio uh, uh, to allow them to evaluate with, uh, whether the price is reasonable or not. Some companies might have been overvalued, which uh, would potentially lead to decline in the price in the future. So some companies, their price is already very high, which means that they are already overvalued. So when they are overvalued, the price of in the market is very high. There's tendency that the price will go down. Usually whatever up will go down definitely. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so if the company is overvalued, the, the investor can make the decision whether maybe they have to sell to avoid that, you know, the downturn of the price, to avoid the price from moving down and then they will be suffering loss. Okay, so this is the three category, uh, type of ratio, earning per share, uh, price earning ratio and also dividend per share. So it is all about looking at share. Yeah. So this is the amount of earning divided by share. This is the amount of dividend uh, per share. And then this is the amount of price earning ratio. Okay. First, we look at the earning uh, per share. Earning per share is looking at the profit divided by number of share. So in the case of Nestle, the uh, profit increase throughout the three years. And then if you look at the number of share, it is uh, not actually uh, changed. Yeah? It is not actually changing because of usually company takes, takes time to increase or decrease the share. Uh, decrease is like impossible, but increase is possible. But usually company will take like, you know, 10 years once only they will increase their share. So that's why if you look at uh, Nestle, the amount of share is uh, similar for the three years period. But here, the amount of uh, net profit after share and dividends actually um, yeah, decrease. Uh, no, it's increasing. It is on increasing tra uh, trend from 587 to 631 and further to 638. So which for investor, this is a good indicator because this is showing that uh, if I invest in the company, the company have ability to pay me dividend because they have a lot of earnings. Earnings is profit, yeah. Okay, the second one is price earning ratio. So earning ratio we already calculated just now. Right? So the same one is used here, earning ratio. Now we are taking the market price. For example, market price of Nestle in the year two one five is eighty ringgit. In the year two one six is hundred. In the year two one seven is one point four six. So you see how drastic the price increase for Nestle. So uh, if we compare it with earning, which is quite stable, so the company are able to make 1.5, uh, 2.5 of PE, PE of 2.5, which in other words, it, it is showing that the price that the investor is paying, you know, the price, the market price that the investor is paying is, right, so sorry, yeah, actually the earning per share, the, the one that I mentioned 2.5, 2.6 and 2.7 is the earning per share, sorry. So the, the ratio, the PE ratio is 31.9, 37.11 and 53.62. So what does it indicates here is, you know, because of the price increase so much from 80 ringgit to 146. So that make the price and ratio also increase. So this is show that the company is highly valued by the investor. Investor willing to pay so much for the company, even though the, the earnings is not actually changed so much. Yeah but they are willing to pay high price. That's why you, you see the ratio increase from one year to another. Okay, so uh, what is limitation of financial ratio? Yeah, so uh, we already learned all the ratios. So what are limitation of financial ratio? Usually because of uh, it is historical value, yeah, the, the, the data being used for the financial statement is historical data, for example, the price of a factory 
bought 10 years ago will be at the price of 10 years ago. It will be not changing. Yeah. Uh, so because of that, it is actually uh, shouldn't be reflecting the future of the company. Yeah? So because information are all historical. Okay, so uh, and then for the historical versus current cost. All right, so the information on uh, income statement is stated at current cost, whereas some element of balance sheet may be stated at historical cost. For example, the you know the uh, asset and all that. Yeah. So this disparity can result in unusual ratio results. So it can result in unusual ratio. And then one more is inflation. Inflation uh, is a rate of uh, price uh, increase or decrease in, in, in a country. If the rate of inflation has changed in any of the periods under review, this can mean that the number are not comparable across period. Okay, so the example, the inflation rate was 100% in one year, sales would appear to have doubled over the preceding year. So, okay, yeah, so you have to be careful on the, uh, on the uh, ratio as well. Okay, uh, aggregation. The, the information in financial statement I, line items that, that you are using for a ratio analysis may have been aggregated differently in the past. So the running, uh, so that running the ratio analysis on a trend basis does not compare the same information through the entire trend period. So that's why analysts, analysts need to be able to understand how accounts is presented. And then you should be also understand the policy that is used by the company, accounting policy. That's why uh, looking through the uh, notes to the account is very important to be able to understand, right? Okay, the next one is about operational changes. A company may change its undertake underlying operational structure to such an extent that the ratio calculated several years ago and compared to the same ratio today would yield a misleading conclusion yeah, because of the uh, operational way of change and the, and the method of operational change. Mm, all right, the next one, accounting policy. Yeah, because of the change in accounting policy as well, uh, you have to be alert. Uh, what are the policy used last year? Why suddenly the price increase? Uh, some usually because of accounting policy change. Okay, uh, how we interpret the ratio? It can be quite difficult to ascertain the reason for the result of the ratio. For example, a ratio of 2.1 might appear to be excellent until you realize that the company just sold a large amount of stocks to bolster its cash position, All right? So there are cases whereby uh, the company suddenly uh, take an action to sell off all the inventory. So definitely it will show a good liquidity position because of the amount of, uh, uh, amount of you know amount of the money is a lot in the company okay company strategy it can be dangerous to conduct ratio analysis um, between two uh, firms that are pursuing different strategy for example one company may allow a following low cost strategy and so it's willing to accept any gross margin in exchange for market share right point in time some ratio extract from the balance sheet which is the time will be very different from the time used in the uh, statement of comprehensive income. Okay, so that's all for today. Any question? Did, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, your assignment, uh, assignment one would include this, but assignment two might include. Yeah? So you have to know how to calculate. Any question before I end the session? All right, if not, then I end the session, then I will share the I will share the slide. Yeah, the, the required slide. Okay, again, for your information, those who newcomer who just joined a uh, letter, uh, today is my last class with all of you. Yeah, but feel free to contact me via WhatsApp. Yeah. Uh, from next week onwards, uh, Dr. Romzi will be taking over. 
So Dr. Ramzi will teach you all the finance subject from week 8 until week 14. Okay. So please feel free to communicate with any of us if you need help with your assignment. Okay. All right. Can Doctor. Yes. Um, so now we have finished with accounting, right? Yes. Next week you will start the topic of uh, finance. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Welcome. Any more question? Okay. So if not, I stop the session. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Please forgive me. Yeah. Please accept my apologies if there is witness on my side. Yeah. I want the best for all of you. So I hope all of you will excel in your future endeavor. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, you madam. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Mahmoud. Welcome, Taiba, Sundus, and Muhammad Ibrahim. Okay, Muhammad Ibrahim, the same person. Okay. Yes.